Saturday, June 18, 1815, Napoleon's armies are en route. The seventh coalition that rose against the would-be conqueror of Europe, or rather re-conqueror of Europe, have ended Napoleon's stubborn attempts to take over the world once and for all. All is lost for the perfectly normal-sized French emperor, because it's a myth started by his enemies that he was even abnormally short. But then suddenly from the thick hazy clouds of cordite and gunpowder that drift across the battlefield comes a high-pitched whine followed by a dull roar. A massive 120mm gun barrel pokes out of the smoke, followed seconds later by a hulking armored body. The 7th coalition forces break out in panic and call for a retreat as 73 tons of pure American freedom roars onto the battlefield. It's the battle that would shape the future of Europe and end the dreams of one of history's greatest military leaders. Only this time, the United States has decided to pay France back for its invaluable aid in winning the colony's freedom during the Revolutionary War by coming to its aid. That's right, fellow Americans, we owe everything to the French, and it's time to pay that debt back. For like the third time in two centuries. The Battle of Waterloo is one of the most important battles in history, and if Napoleon had won, the whole world would be eating croissants and skipping showers for weeks at a time because France would be an unstoppable superpower. Given how the 20th century would shape up, however, perhaps this slightly smellier, hairier world would have been preferable to the one we got. The stage was set when Napoleon escaped his island prison on the island of Elba. Because even if you kill millions of people and try to take over the world, as long as you're rich, the worst you'll get is an exile to a Mediterranean paradise. However, Napoleon hadn't quite given up on the whole world ruling thing yet, and the British, who thought it was a bit rude in it, prepared to ship him off to an even more isolated, decidedly less paradisey island in the Atlantic. When Napoleon got wind of this, he escaped Elba with 700 of his followers, because apparently nobody in Europe thought that it was a problem to imprison him with a literal army. France had moved on from Napoleon, though, with the restored Louis XVIII sitting on France's throne. This didn't mean that Napoleon wasn't still heavily favored among the French despite his failed military conquest that ended in the defeat of his grand army in the snowy fields of Russia. There were plenty of French people who still wished to make France great again, as Napoleon landed on French soil at Goulfajon and headed north to the capital. He was quickly intercepted by the 5th Regiment of the French Army, which had been sent to capture him, only for Napoleon to pull an admittedly extremely baller move. With the soldiers of the regiment bearing rifles down on Napoleon, he approached them alone, dismounted his horse, and threw his arms up, shouting, Here I am, kill your emperor if you wish. The soldiers of the 5th Regiment carefully thought this over for a moment and then decided, We tried taking over the world once before, failed miserably, and are now significantly weaker and the nations divide it, ah, screw it, vive l'empereur. Now Napoleon had a proper army, and as he marched on to Paris, more and more defectors joined his rank. Louis XVIII was forced to flee to Belgium in the wake of his crumbling support, and soon after, at the Congress of Vienna, Great Britain, Russia, Austria, and Prussia all decided they'd had about enough of Napoleon's crap and began to muster a massive army. Napoleon, though, had a brilliant plan. He would strike first even if his forces were outnumbered nearly four to one. Realizing the disadvantage he would be at if he allowed the Allied powers to consolidate their forces, he marched into modern-day Belgium with a force of 200,000 ready to eat waffles and kick ass. And they'd just run out of waffles. His goal was to drive the British back into the sea and knock Prussia out of the war in one fell swoop, significantly leveling the playing field and encouraging French-speaking sympathizers in Belgium to launch a revolt. After initial skirmishes with the Prussians, the Battle of Waterloo was on. Unfortunately for Napoleon, stubborn British resistance at Montchion Hamlet bled a significant amount of his forces. The British, led by the future Duke of Wellington, who'd taken a break from inventing beef pastries to command the anti-Napoleon army, withstood wave after wave of French attacks. The Prussians, in a slight disarray after a previous engagement with the advancing French, began to arrive and attack the flanks of Napoleon's army relieving the pressure on the British. As evening approached, Napoleon sent the best of his best, the elite Imperial Guard. But the Emperor would not protect this time. Prussian forces broke through the right flank, and the combined Prussian-British force would rout Napoleon's army, putting an end once and for all to his ambitions. The friendship between the German and the British people would last forever and never result in a war again. But that's the old, decidedly less mental timeline 
where the modern-day United States didn't send an Abrams main battle tank back in time to turn the tide of Napoleon's most fateful battle. Arriving through a time portal with the crackling of electricity and the smell of ozone, the 73-ton monster is America's latest and greatest. An M1A2 equipped with a SEP V3 modernization package, originally designed to crush Soviet armor under its treads, the Abrams has one of the most, if not the most, impressive combat records in the world. Nine Abrams have been destroyed to date, seven of them to friendly fire, and two destroyed when they became stuck in order to prevent their capture. The only tank in the world that compares is the British Challenger, and indeed the two share a whole lot of DNA thanks to shared technology between the two allies. But the Abrams has a much more exhaustive combat record because America loves two things, freedom and bringing freedom to places that didn't specifically request it at the time. With three decades of combat experience under its belt, the Abrams kill-to-death ratio is frankly embarrassing and prompted a panic in the Cold War-era Kremlin when it eviscerated Soviet-made tanks in Desert Storm. Protecting the Abrams is a composite armor whose makeup is one of the US and Britain's best-kept secrets. Rather than solid plates of armor, the Abrams uses a combination of empty spaces, rubber plates, and ceramics to shatter, dissipate, and withstand the heat of incoming rounds. The armor is so good that an Abrams front armor was strong enough to withstand hits from other Abrams infamous silver bullet kinetic projectiles during Desert Storm in friendly fire incidents. On the offense, the Abrams packs a 120mm smooth bore gun that fires up to 42 rounds of freedom and justice for all. To deal with lightly armored vehicles or infantry, it also features both a pintle mounted and coaxial 7.62mm machine gun as well as a 50 caliber heavy machine gun that will literally and very accurately saw a camel in two. Don't ask us how we know that, just accept it as fact. Its Honeywell AGT-1500 turbine engine has more in common with a high-performance fighter jet's engine than the one in your crappy second-hand Ford Fiesta. This monster delivers 1500 horsepower of pure, uncut American bald eagle muscle, and it needs it to move the nearly 74-ton monster around. Despite its size, though, the Abrams floats like a heavily armored butterfly, able to move at 45 miles per hour on roads or even faster if you bribe the mechanics to remove the governor and the first sergeant isn't around. Facing off against a single M1 is the full force of Beef Wellingtons and the Prussian Army, a combined total of between 118,000 to 120,000 soldiers. British soldiers at the time were equipped with funny-looking uniforms, as was the custom at the time, and armed with a variety of weapons. The infantry was equipped with muzzle-loading muskets, boasting a firing rate of three to four shots a minute for well-trained and disciplined troops not currently browning their pants as a 73-ton monster from the future bears down on them. The muskets were more or less accurate, up to 100 meters, with emphasis on the less rather than the more but were surprisingly deadly to unarmored personnel thanks to their large projectiles. A bayonet would be fitted to the muzzle of the rifle or used on its own for fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting, which would frequently erupt as armies got bored of shooting at each other and largely missing for hours on end. The British were equipped with 156 guns or cannons, the heaviest of which was the Bloomfield cannon. This monster of the day fired a 9-pound cannonball which would smash through enemy formations, murdering or horribly maiming men as it knocked them around like pins in a bowling alley. Because infantry of the day had to march and fight in close, tightly packed formations, or they wouldn't hit the broadside of a barn with their rifles, cannons were particularly effective, and most armies rushed to close the distance. Both sides used case shot for closer range engagements, canisters loaded with smaller iron balls that would have a shotgun-like effect. The British, however, had begun experimenting with shrapnel rounds, which detonated to unleash a fury of much smaller iron balls over a very wide area. To put it mildly, there did not exist a single weapon in the British or Prussian arsenal which could effectively damage, let alone destroy, an M1 Abrams tank. An Abrams can survive a shot from a friendly Abrams firing Super Sabo rounds with a muzzle energy in excess of 12 million joules, a figure so high it would blow the pants off any 18th century physicist. The only hope the British might have had would have been larger bore naval cannons which might have dented the Abrams' exterior armor. What was on the battlefield at the time, however, wouldn't have done much more than scratch the paint and potentially damage the turret-mounted machine guns. In exchange, the Abrams can employ a variety of round types to deal with different targets, 
the new fifth-generation kinetic energy cartridge, or M829A4KE cartridge, is, per the U.S. Army, the best anti-tank round in the world. And unlike the Russian Ministry of Defense, when the U.S. military boasts about something, it's usually right. That was the deal the American public struck with its government. No health care, but we get to be the best at blowing things up. The Abrams also fires a variety of high-explosive rounds, which can also be used as anti-tank munitions or special obstacle clearing munitions. Whether it's an enemy tank, a small building, or one of those influencer it's just a prank bro guys at the mall, there's no problem the Abrams can't make disappear with its 120mm cannon. However, perfect for this specific engagement is its canister round, a special round developed for close-in protection from mass infantry or simply to break up enemy formations. Effective at a range between 200 and 500 meters, the M1028 canister cartridge fires a deadly shower of tungsten at 4,626 feet per second, essentially turning the Abrams 120mm cannon into the world's most nightmarish shotgun. Lord Beef Wellington would be helpless to stop the advancing Abrams, though the tank does have one key weakness. It only carries 42 rounds total for its main cannon and around 900 rounds for each machine gun. This significantly limits its impact on a battlefield, especially when facing over 100,000 troops. But even outnumbered, the Abrams has one final trick up its sleeve, a careful military maneuver known as just run everyone the hell over. With several hours worth of fuel, our time-traveling Abrams can outrun even the swiftest Prussian or British cavalry and turn a hole of Waterloo into human jelly. In defense of the old red, white, and blue, or actually the blue, white, and red, the Abrams is an unstoppable monster, at least until it runs out of fuel. Because in sustained combat operations, the Abrams is a thirsty boy. However, with the Allied forces completely routed in a blind panic thanks to a time-traveling tank, there's a good chance that Napoleon would have gotten his desired revolution in the United Kingdom of the Netherlands, with fresh support and an ecstatic French population rejuvenated to try and make France great again. There's a good chance Napoleon would have been able to achieve many of his prior conquests, albeit this time with a more careful invasion of Russia, and all it would take for the modern world to be unified under one banner would be a single time-traveling American Abrams tank. Now go check out the French Revolution in a nutshell or click this other video instead.